Welcome back to The Urban Monk. I am here with my dear friend and someone who's returning to the show, Robin Euclis. Uh, she had a baby about a year ago, uh, and so she used to hang around my house coming through doing cooking segments when I had babies and were crawling all over. And so now the tables have turned and she is home dealing with the, the young momminess of it all. And uh, she has better than survived. She's radiant, she's beautiful, she's rocking it, and she's feeding herself and her family and her baby well. So Welcome back to the show. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's crazy. When I first did the episodes for Quick Cook, um, I was pregnant. And so you were hiding, like you were hiding it, kind of. <laughs> I mean, not really at that point. And now there's an almost one-year-old, a little red-headed, blue-eyed doll in the picture who's just changed everything in the best way possible, so. Absolutely. How did, how, here. How's it been? Rough year, awesome year, no. all the above? Mostly awesome. It really has. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm having. I had a kid later, later years of life. You know, not. I'm not 23. Like I've seen all my friends go through this, so I've learned some things along the way. You know, have good help. Have your family around you. Get as much support as you can. Take care of yourself first thing in the morning. Shower every day. You know, so I really focused on doing those small things, and they made the world of difference for me. Mm. Where I felt like, and still feel like the whole time. You know, most days I've got this. Some days it feels crazy, but most days I'm like, this is great. Yeah, that's great. That's that's a wonderful. See, that's the that's really kind of the trade-off between uh, hurrying up and waiting, is when <laughs> when you do it when you do it in your 20s, you got more energy to run after them. But when you do it in like your 30s or 40s, you got more wisdom and you got like advice that you'll actually you know take counsel on, and so you're just smarter about things, hopefully. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Although I think we've hacked energy by now, don't you? For the most part, you know. For me, I, you know, I kind of got my ass kicked with sleep, and so like I mm -hmm. never had sleep problems, and all of a sudden I wasn't sleeping at all, and I, you know, I had a couple of rough months of just not being able to like function well, and it was just like, whoa, okay, look at that kryptonite, right? And and had to make adjustments very quickly. But yeah, for the most part, I mean, if you're not eating Doritos and drinking Dr. Peppers or Diet Coke, if for some reason people still think Diet Coke is better for them. Uh, and, and you know, you're eating better food, chances are you're going to you're going to do pretty well in all this. Yeah. Yeah. The no sleep thing is definitely interesting though. It's there's a reason they use that as a form of torture. Totally. You know, it's wild. And then what happened for me, which I'd never heard anybody talk about, is when she did start sleeping better, my schedule was all all messed up. Mm. So mm. I, my body wasn't able to rest when it was night and be awake during the day. So I had to do some of those grounding rituals and be outside more and see sunshine and the sun setting to really help reset me. So things I'd never thought about before either. It's weird, right? Like we habituate faster than we think. And so, you know, it's... I was having mid, like two in the morning to four in the morning, I would just randomly wake up even if the kids were down. Uh, and my poor wife, I mean, like I was, you know, kind of traveling and working and not there all the time. And it's just, it took a while to get through that. And it screws up with your ghrelin levels. It, it screws your leptin levels. It really messes with satiety and weight gain and weight loss. I mean, I had about 10, 15 pounds I gained. Um, you know, I was doing everything I was normally doing, just not sleeping. And so, how did, I mean, you look great. So did you, or, or is this like post baby weight? Did you ever put any on? Like, let's be honest about it. <laughs> yeah, let's totally be honest about it. I think I gained about an average amount of weight um, when I was pregnant. I didn't really worry about it. I was like, I'm just not gonna worry about this. What I am going to focus on is making sure that I move my body every day and staying as healthy as I can. And I really did do that. I didn't use my pregnancy as an opportunity. Well, now I'm gonna eat all the ice cream I want mm. because I eat whatever I want most of the time. Most of the time I don't want ice cream. I do want the healthier versions of these things and sometimes I'll have a healthier treat. So I really did focus on that throughout my pregnancy. And then after, guess what? I really kind of did the same thing. I kind of decided that I wasn't gonna worry about it because I've learned for myself when I try and diet and when I stress about eating a certain way, is when I'm my heaviest. When I focus on the most of the time foods that I'm gonna eat, the good for your gut foods, getting the sauerkraut, eating more simply, breathing while I'm eating, then my weight just falls into a natural place. And that's what happened too with, with the baby weight. It just really kind of slowly, slowly, and each stage I saw a different shift in my body. I'd say around four, four months post baby, I saw a level drop in my weight. And then around six months, I saw the muscle kind of come back. And now that I'm between nine, you know, 10, 11 months, now I'm like, oh, 
oh, I look, I look good. I look good. When did that happen? Like, I really didn't even, you know, I put on a pair of jeans. I was like, oh, you look, you look fly tonight. And, and I had it, you know, again, same kind of thing, focusing, getting my workouts in, eating the foods that I like to eat that make me feel good. And other than that, I never really, you know, let it get the best of my emotional center. I just trusted and the trust allowed me to relax. That's the hardest part though, right? Because people get so freaked out about baby weight. They get so freaked out about body image, self image, and you know, all, all kinds of things. I mean, you're nursing and you know, it's just, it's, it's a big sloppy mess. Like there's a lot that goes on that oh. just makes you feel like not yourself. I mean, I, I, I'm a, a, a firsthand witness. I obviously didn't go through it, but I was right there with my, um, with my wife as you know, she was going through it. And, you know, it does. It, it does kind of wear on you. If you're not careful about your, your self-definition, it really messes with you. Now, you said something in there that I want to tease out because you're um, very much uh, an advocate of good gut health. You've been really kind of pushing on healing the gut and cleansing the gut in a way that, that you know, most people don't really even talk about. Like, so you got to chew and, you know, all these things that people are like, what, what are you talking about? Um, how much of that worked for you in this? How much of that really like kind of created the sanity and, and, and really the health that, you know, a lot of people lose during this kind of yeah. first year onboarding process? Yeah. Um, great question. I, for me, focusing on the gut gave me a calm and the way that I, I choose to focus on it, right? Like you said, so many people are teaching about gut health. It's super popular, trendy, and, and for good reason. You know, it's all the research is, is true. You know, it is the center of everything, your immune system, your, your core, um, all of your functions are there. But the way that I do teach about it is about chewing, slowing down. And the reason that those practices saved me from the diet roller coaster is the same reason that they've helped me now with a baby because they're simple um, daily action items that I can focus on. So just chewing my food completely before I swallow. So even though I may have a boob, a, a boob in a baby's mouth over here and I've got the phone here and my food in front of me, when I take that bite, you know, maybe I'm not at a perfect mindful meal, but I take that bite, I can chew, 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 chew before slowing down, before swallowing. And just simplifying and being able to focus on just a few basic things like that just makes me feel saner. It's not like, oh, well, this diet or am I eating grains or not eating grains or what is my breakfast or did I even get breakfast today? But it's like, you know what, Robin, just focus on those simple gut-friendly practices. Everything else got quieter. The mm. noise calmed down. Hmm. I, you know, we had this problem with a few parents in our ecosystem where the kids were just kind of being difficult around meals. So like we had this one mom that would bring a kid over that was like always like, you know, here, watch YouTube. And she, you know, like, so, so I could feed you. And, and it started creating all this dissonance around the ritual of, of meals. And we're trying to hold the line. And I just got to the point where I'm like, honey, these people can't come to our dinner table and disrupt it. Cause like now my kids, like, why don't I get YouTube? And so that the, the sanctity of that meal, the ability to slow down and just really be at a meal together and savor and chew and all those things. I mean, that's a that's a hard line to, to really hold. And God bless you for doing it, right? Like I, I've had to fight for it and we've got it good now, but you know, the world is always banging, right? There's always some show, there's always something trying to come in and break up the, the sanctity of a slow, a slow chew there, right? And you know, I you can chew fast too. You just want to do the best job that you can. Right. And you know, a, a, one of my best friends a while back, and I think this has since changed, but in the beginning she said, you know, my daughter's never seen me eat. You know, she's so concerned with making sure she has her meals and getting her really healthy organic food on her plate that she never sees her tending to her food needs first. Hmm. And so I really took that again, that same like wisdom, hmm. you know, having kids in your, in your 30s of saying, okay, I want to do that differently. I want to make sure that my daughter sees that no matter what, like I am making sure that I'm fed. Obviously this doesn't happen every single time, but it does happen nine out of 10. Mm, mm, that's really interesting. And, and how you model is how they're gonna start eating and how they're going to kind of grow into the adults that they are. Um, you know, I, you, gotta I, fight for it. you gotta fight for it. Just like you said, it's, it's hard, it is. They see the other kids and you know, we're lucky that 
at least we have those beautiful experiences to pull from. You know, you were raised in a wonderful family food environment. I was too. And so I know what that feels like. So I want that. But even if our generation didn't have that, that's a hard thing to create out of nowhere because they don't have their own personal experience. So, so a lot of people grew up, I mean, and you're absolutely right. Like I'm very blessed. You were very blessed. Like my parents didn't let junk food in the house. We had meals together. It was a thing, right? It's, it's a kind of old world cultural thing. And I'm so thankful for it now. Um, I have many Many friends that used to, you know, that grew up basically, everyone just like, you know, dished their dinner and they'd sit by the TV together, and like it was just this kind of breakdown of family family uh, communications. And so, if that's how you grow grow up or grew up, what then can you do to really start setting a rhythm of a ritual uh, to kind of get sync with what we're talking about here? Yeah. Great question because, wow, it's everything. Um, my biggest tip is coming to you from exactly where I am. Um, I just moved, so I don't have a lot of lighting in my apartment yet, and most of the lighting's in my kitchen. So get in your kitchen, get cooking a meal, and do it ideally with your kids if they're of that age. Even if it's something that you would think that isn't healthy, maybe it's just pasta and sauce out of a jar. Great. Get in the kitchen with them, have, prepare that meal together. You know, that something like that takes 10 minutes and no brain power, right? Box of pasta. Ideally, you know, they have all these wonderful pasta alternatives now that are made out of quinoa or spelt or, you know, gluten-free options. You know, maybe it's a nice jar of organic pasta sauce that was on sale. Maybe it's regular. Start somewhere. Create that meal so you're invested in it a little bit. Obviously, you can go a little further with some recipes, but something so basic as that. But it's, there's a community element of we put this together and then sit down and just even if it's once a week plan one that's why I I love I'm Jewish and we have Shabbat I love Shabbat dinner because we travel a lot but when we're in town and it's a Friday night my husband and I both kind of there's an unspoken knowing that oh well we're gonna have dinner at home together and light the candles so maybe that's a Sunday supper maybe that's a Monday it's just one meal that you cook and you have together and the family knows like if they've got soccer practice whatever everybody's got going on you, you find, even if that's a breakfast on Sunday, you know, there's got to be one slot in your whole hectic family life that you guys can all come together mm. for just one meal. And even if you aren't um, accustomed to that, there's something so powerful with candlelight. I mean, it really sets mm-hmm. the, the, the cadence. It sets the tone uh, and the energy of the room. And so even if it's not, even if it's, you know, you're not Jewish and you're like, well, we don't do that. It's like, well, no, candles are pretty non-denominational. Like, just light them, right? And, and, it, and it sets the tone and, and the energy of the room in a way that really helps slow things down. And, you know, people talk about candlelit dinners. It's not that hard to do, right? Um, yeah. and, and, you know, what's funny is everyone used to have candlelit dinners and then electricity got cheaper <laughs> and now candles are this thing that we don't do. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Um, so speaking of burning candles. And can I give a quick can I give yeah. a quick tip on the candle thing too? A lot of people I find with my clients and my community from my book um, keep stuff like that special. They keep it in a credenza or they keep the special tapered candle for mm. occasions. Buy some inexpensive candles or whatever it is that you like. Put them in the middle of the table. Leave them. There, so it's easy, accessible, and it's in front of your face where you almost have no option to not do it, right? So I have to give my little, like, get in there practical tip. Um, but yeah, keep, you know, basic, unscented, soy-based candle right in the middle. Have it there so that you're reminded, oh, yeah, I can just light this and it's nothing. I don't have to go get anything. Yeah, you know, the, the challenge we're having in my household is every time we light uh, a candle, we got to sing happy birthday. <laughs> Because <laughs> my son thinks that you know candles always mean happy birthday, so it's just cute enough. We always do it. We sing. It's great. But like literally, we sing happy birthday like nine times a night if we have candles on. So it's it's uh, man. And so like I, I I'm burning candles in my life, right? And as are you. You are an author. I think you have another book that you've been working on. Um, and so you know it's one of these things where you're you know you're at home. You're trying to be like yummy and delicious, mommy, and kind of like slow down time and be with your baby and your family. And then you're out there trying to help people learn from what you know your life experience is so finding that balance I know is hard how are you doing it how's the book coming along thank you I haven't announced about the second book yet so this is first first little sound bite for your audience so wow did I just um, like blow your cover <laughs> no no I've hinted at it I've okay, hinted at okay. it sort of mentioned it, but there hasn't been like a formal but yes there is a book too coming nice. um so yeah so I've had to learn to be a lot more flexible. I much prefer my straightforward laptop. I'm focused. I'm in the zone. 
nothing else exists but my work and the like clients and the craving that I have for that. Um, I used to be terrible at sending emails from my phone, posting from my phone. I was very all or nothing. And for me, I've learned it's, it can't be one or the other. I need my focus time, but I've shortened that a bit. And then I need to be a little bit more flexible. You know, sometimes it is going to be shooting an email off and knowing that I'm doing that sometimes, but it's not a big part of the, of the picture. So scheduling out my focus time and then a little bit of flexible makes me feel like, okay, I'm, I'm here, I'm being a mom, but I'm also getting to, you know, do the work that I, I have to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For your sanity and for the good of humanity. Yep. That's a big yeah. deal. It's a big deal. I've learned to, yeah, I've learned to like in the, in moving in the past couple of weeks where I didn't get to have sitting with my team at the big table and everyone's got their beverages and their food and like getting to really dive into my work. I haven't had that in the way that I've had to. And oh my God, have I missed. It's nice once in a while to be reminded of how like, I just want to get to the table with my team, you know, to have that feeling again, you know, it's there, but to really taste it like so fresh knowing that that's what you love to do so much, just to have that recent reminder and the hecticness of everything has been sweet. So even in the crazy, you get these love, lovely little moments of like, yeah, this that's is it. awesome. Well, and, and look, the crazy is not gonna stop. Time is compressed. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of things going on. Um, you know, you live in New York area. I live in LA area. I mean, we're urban people, right? And so, you know, time is something that's a scarcity. And so you gotta really kind of hedge your bet and be able to do the things that you wanna do for yourself. So if you wanna cook, you gotta know how to like whip up a meal. And so we actually did, uh, you know, so uh, to, to the audience, there's a couple, uh, I think we've, they're on well.org now, right? So we just did a couple videos uh, with her several months ago, obviously now, and we're, we're now <laughs> finally like releasing them uh, called The Quick Cook, where Robin came to my kitchen in Southern California and just whipped up a couple quick recipes and it was just bang, 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 in and out, and it was wonderful. Uh, so those are on the well.org blog. You could find them there and we'll post them in Facebook and all that, but check those out because you know it doesn't take long to make good quality healthy food if you know how to do it if you, your mind is kind of assembled around it it's actually it takes less than going to a restaurant yeah as long as you, you've got a little bit of prep in there okay what are the basics that I can keep in my in my pantry and also accepting who you are as a cook if you're someone that you're like I need one new recipe a week then that's all you do. If you're someone that's like, you know what, I've got my favorites, I'm just gonna make them again and again, then that's what you do. It's the shoulding all over mm. ourselves when it comes to cooking. You know, mm. I should be making more of this, I should be doing that. That's, ex that's what exhausts you. Yeah. That's what drains your energy and doesn't get that food on the table. So think about, you know, what's, what's real for me? What feels attainable? How can I stretch just a little bit but feels like it will actually happen? That's the most important way to get yourself cooking. It's, it's really interesting. This culture around cooking and cooking shows is all about these like elite chefs that are making these like amazing gourmet meals or these poor browbeaten chefs that are just getting destroyed in some sort of like chef incubator and it's all stress and crappy. And so the, the, the entire message around cooking is either like you're either cordon bleu and making stuff that's worthy of eating or you suck or you know you could, you could crank out a meal for 9,500 9, people tonight or you fail or you're fired or whatever. <laughs> and really what, it, what matters is you know you got a husband and a kid at home so you got to just whip up something that's healthy for three people and it doesn't got to look pretty it, you know all of these things that are kind of coupled up with our idea of cooking that make it undoable make it hard for us to even like kind of approach I, I love the fact that you're dispelling that and and using you know your the quick cook and all, all the different things that you're doing to kind of break that mold thank you yeah it, and, and I love sharing with my clients that how I eat most of the time because most people would assume, you know, and I can even include a little day in the life of Robin and put that in the comments later. You know, most people assume I'm making complicated recipes, you know, every night of the week. Most, you know, every week I make some version of a pasta and sauce. It's just mm -hmm. a pasta that's made out of red lentils and it's an organic sauce. And I know to, you know, throw in a pile of baby kale or serve it with, you know, a lot of steamed broccoli, for example. I know how to make these little tweaks. And then sometimes I'm cooking from my book, you know, or I'm cooking the, the recipes that I made on the Quick Cook. The Quick Cook, we're, we're showing a pizza. It's a basic pizza that uses a brown rice tortilla. And a lot of people wouldn't think to do that, but what an easy pantry item that most of us have around that we can just think about elevating. So I'm so excited to get to show people because a lot of people still need to see 
things. Mm-hmm. You know, they need to watch it to be like, oh, I can do that. Yeah. You know, that doesn't seem that hard. Well, and that's just it. it it's got to be approachable and it has to be something that um, I don't have to take this huge leap of faith to do, right? It's one thing to watch the X Games and to think I'm going to do like Ninja Warrior. It's another to be able to do like five pull-ups, right? Like, like most people, it's just this yeah. huge gap in aspiration. And so cooking shouldn't be that hard, especially since we eat at least three times a day. Like, it, you know, it, the inaccessibility of that craft is, is really, you know, um, I think a challenge for our culture. Um, and, you know, look at you, you're sitting in your kitchen. Um, are you still coaching people? Are you still working with people to, to do what you do? I am, I am. Um, so I work with people in several ways. I do a little, a small handful of one-on-one clients, and then I have a couple of groups that I run. So one program is called Your Healthiest You, and that's a six-week virtual course. So you can do it anywhere, um, and it includes, you know, all the basics around fermentation, energy, you know, all the like well re- wellness junky stuff that we're dying to know about. Um, and then I also include a meal prep cooking class with that course as well. So people, you're actually in the kitchen with me in real time, making a week's worth of food over the course of an hour. That's great. So, and yeah, and I've had so many people like that, tell me that that meal prep course like changed their lives. Because again, they got to see it. They're like, Hmm. it's one thing for us to talk about this, but to get to see, oh, that's how she sort of kind of puts everything together. I can do that too. So again, that empowerment. Yeah, that's one. You know, batch cooking has changed my life, right? It's it's so you can't. I mean, cooking every night is really challenging. You know, cooking two nights a week for the week and having different variations and things to you know support your family is doable, right? Yes, and there's different kinds of batch cooking. You know, in that meal prep class, for example, I do cover it. You know, over a couple of hours, what you would do in a couple of hours. But then I have clients that I've worked with or coach that say they batch cook one or two things every other night. Mm. And then it still kind of adds up in the same way. Mm. So on Monday, they make the chicken breast and quinoa and serve that with a salad. And then Wednesday, they make a big soup. And then by Friday, they have chicken cut up that they put in the soup with some of the, you know what I'm saying? They sort of do it. Staggered. Yeah, they're like, yeah, staggered because that's what Mm. she can manage because she doesn't have one to two hours. She has a half hour and she can do one other thing on the stove at the same time. I love it. I love it. And and because she doesn't have two hours, it doesn't mean it's not a non-starter. It means that you just make your own rules. And I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up is just in in the thought process of all this is like, you know, I'm not going to, I don't have time to put on an apron, so I'm not doing anything. And that's just, this is, it's not practical. It's not realistic. Um, I actually, like uh, my my show producer just sent me things. So, so we actually have a link to your, uh, cooking thing it's called well it's well.org slash yhy so your healthiest you uh for anyone who's interested in, in learning how to do this and kind of just getting out of your own way and figuring out how to cook i mean for me it was i, gr- I grew up kind of nurtured like i was a straight a student i didn't have to do any of that stuff mom took care of it and then you know college happened and then reality set and i realized i had zero domestic skills and my friends who i'm like <laughs> roommating with are like dude you're useless and so I had like an abrupt curve where I had to learn how to cook and do laundry and all sorts of stuff where I was like, wow, mom, that didn't really serve me, right? Like it's supposed to be the handoff to like a wife who then doesn't let you do stuff in an old world model that, you know, there's no division of labor and all that crap. And so, you know, that's not the beach I splashed up on in the West, right? And so, you know, we, we should all be useful. You should all know how to like, you know, scramble eggs and just make basic stuff in the kitchen. Um, and I love that that's kind of where you start from um, and then you kind of grow out from there. So when uh, when's your book available like is that like a, a long ways away or you I know you, you had a book that came out last year yeah I have a book that came out last year called go with you go with your gut um, available and you guys probably will share the info for that as well um, and then the my next book will likely be I'm hoping next year early next year Got so it. keep, in, keep an it. eye for that and just to let you know in the where I came from yes I grew up in a house with a mom that cooked but what I ate in college dinner was saltines dipped in tomato sauce and dessert was saltines dipped in jelly. Wow. Like I, I literally ate that in my dorm room and I used to eat the um, noodle soup, you know, the soup with the, what is it? The noodles in the alphabet or whatever. Mm. I'd eat that cold out of the can. Got it. So, you, so you, you've, you've run some miles too. So I've run some miles, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, good for you. Good for you. Yeah, and that, that's really it. Is like, you know what, every single one of us can learn how to do this and turn things around with our next meal. Because guess what? Yeah. You know, predictably, you're going to be hungry within a few hours. And, you know, that's the next opportunity to learn something. So I love it. Yeah. I love it. And also, we're 
all starting, you know, we all kind of think that, well, I didn't get it right in the kitchen. So, um, you know, I suck at that or I'm going to be, a, you know, I'm a failure. I, I give you all permission to learn, you know, mm. it, it takes some time to figure out what's the right amount of groceries to buy. What, how, how can I be efficient in the grocery store? How can I be efficient with the food that I have in my fridge? You know, if a recipe didn't taste great, how can I adjust it next time? Just knowing that you, you don't necessarily start at like a 10. It takes, you know, it takes a month, like say, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the rest of January or, you know, February one is your, is your cooking month. And you're deciding that that's going to be the one thing that you're really focusing on that, that you're giving yourself the space to play and get it wrong mm. until you get it right. That's it. That's it. And getting it wrong is, you know, every single step you take towards getting it wrong helps you get it right. But most of us just have such an issue with failure and all that. So it's like if you have a family that's judgmental, pull them in with you. Like it's your recipe you screwed up on together. Like it's fine. Like, you know, <laughs> it's a group thing. You're like, yeah, this. This tastes terrible. You're right, guys. Yeah. What could you know? we what could we have done better? Right. But it takes all that judgment and like weird sense of self stuff out of it, which is <clears throat> a lot of us have this. A lot of us <coughs> excuse me. Like, you know, especially females. <coughs> they get this going in. It's like, I, I should be good at this. Right. But I'm not. The shooting, right. shooting all over ourselves again. You know, that's me. what keeps us stuck. That's what keeps us in our old bodies. That's what keeps us out of the kitchen. And that's what keeps us from really living the life that we imagine in our in our minds and our hearts. That's it. That's it. And, and frankly, who cares what people think about you? Just get, just do it until you're good. I know we don't. Yeah. We certainly don't care what people think. Man, about. man. I would have, yeah, as I was going to say, I would have done a lot of things differently. You know, I, you know, I'm just fighting the good fight. You're doing the same. You know, I love the fact that you got a, a little baby at home. We got to get our kids together. And um, next time you're in Cali, we'll do it. Uh, yeah. The videos are on well.org. Quick cook. Check them out. They're awesome. Uh, we had a good time. She was in my kitchen, uh, zhuzhing around her sauces and whatever she was doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I've actually tried bo both recipes and it's been a lot of fun. So check out the blog and uh, we'll put links to, you know, if you want more coaching and more training to all the stuff that she's done, including her book. I love what you're doing. I know your kids got to eat right now. So I'm going to step out of the way of mama <laughs> bear here and thank you for, for joining me back on the show. You're always welcome. It's always a, a delight to hang out with you. Thank you. I love you, Pedro. I love your family and I love your well.org community. You guys are the best. You show up, your people show up. They want this, you know, and they do it with a smile and a laugh and, just all more laughs for everyone. I'm just, just love being here. Love being with you. You're the love best. It. Love it. Have the best of best of nights out there in New York, and uh, hope to see you soon. Okay. Let Thank me know what you time. think. Check out check out the blog well.org. They should be you know right there on the home page, and it's called the Quick Cook. And uh, give me comments. Tell me what else you want to see. And uh, next time she's in town, I'm going to drag her into the kitchen, and uh, maybe we'll do a video together. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.